We have an interesting topic today, one I haven't tackled, and that is navigating the court system. Now, typically, I will work with people who either use me, use an attorney, or use somebody else to file, and they don't really generally go to court. But for those of you who need to use the court system straight away, that need to go to the court yourself, that may need to file for hearings for one reason or another. I think having Gail Glazer here, the only court appointed mediator we have had on the show, Gail, in four years. Thank you. This well, is you're more than welcome. Yeah, no, this is really good because you have information from inside the court that people typically wouldn't have. And even if those listening don't need that hands-on experience, I bet they know people who do. So it's fun. It's fun talking about it and extending people's knowledge base. So first of all, Gail, do you work at more than one courthouse? I did in the past. I've experienced several different courthouses in the Los Angeles Superior Court Division. Uh, for the last several years, I've only worked at one. And which one uh, is that? And Fine. that would be Chatsworth Courthouse. And I've been there, like I said, um, for the last several years, I would say. Excellent. Okay. So this is great. Um, and you mediate four cases inside the courthouse. Okay. Exceptional. Next question. How, how did you get started doing this? When I was doing my training at Cal State Northridge, one of the components of the training was to actually go and volunteer your time at the courthouse. And in those days, it wasn't volunteer. It was part of the program. You had to put in so many hours on the job training and there was nothing better than actually going in person to the courthouses to see how everything actually worked in the real world. It was different than the information that we got from the professor, from the class, and from the books that we read. It was an important component, and that was my first introduction to the courthouse system. You know, Gail, I've never worked at the courthouse. I've never mediated a case at the courthouse. So this is equally fascinating to me to find out what goes on in the courthouse. Now, in Chatsworth, I bet we have a variety of cultures and languages uh, amongst the people who live in the area who would file in Chatsworth, yes? Yes, Correct. And Gail, you are bi at least bilingual. I know you're Spanish English. Any other languages? Uh, yeah, several other languages, but I'm uh, French, but I've never had cause to have to use French. And I am not as fluent in French as I am in Spanish. Of course, English is my first language. Yes. I, you know, th that's also great. So you're a rare breed in terms of being multilingual as a mediator. So that's that's cool. You know, it, it's cool because people relax, don't they, when they're speaking to somebody who speaks their language? It's one of the important things that you've just hit on, Judy, and I'm glad that you brought this up because that's very true. You, as a mediator, you have to gain the trust of the parties since you're being, being neutral the entire way through and impartial. One of the best ways to do that is to speak the same language as the clients. Immediately, you're able to break the ice, you're able to put them at ease, make them feel comfortable, and to take them on a journey with you through the court system in uh, which many cases they know nothing about. Practically, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, people don't understand how to maneuver and what's going to happen that day. All they know is that they have a date in court and they're there to see the judge. That's all they know when they come in. So being bilingual has been a huge benefit. And again, I would say in the global economy of this world, it's very important to be bilingual or trilingual. As we go from state to state here, across the contiguous United States, we cross a border into another state and everybody still speaks English. If you take Europe, for example, 
you cross a border and you're in another country with another language. So I think that as Americans, we're very uh, monolingual, I'd say generally speaking. And it has been a huge benefit in my life to be bilingual because you're exposed to and you learn about different cultures and different customs and the subtleties involved in that. So again, it's been huge and I think it's contributed greatly to my success as a mediator. And I'm going to guess because in each culture, they have a certain view and perspective on whatever it is they're dealing with in, in, in whatever area of law. And to be able to understand that is highly beneficial in order to, again, the trust, understand where they're coming from and not misinterpret what they mean when they say, well, this is how I would like to make the offer or negotiate, right? One thing that I find that's very interesting, one of the cases that I came across when I was doing my training, and this was at Van Nuys Courthouse, I came across a case where the defendants in the case were both from another country, and they had come here as immigrants. They now owned apartment buildings, and they had tenants in the apartment building and they, a tragedy occurred to the defendants in this case. It was a terrible tragedy. Their 30-year-old son, who was a medical doctor, died unexpectedly. He had a, a maybe a heart attack or whatever. And uh, as mediators, we hear both sides of the stories. And when I heard the plaintiff was suing them for non-return of their security deposit on the department, but because this tragedy had happened to them, they believe so much in the system of US justice that their contention was that because of the tragedy they had been through, there would be no judge in this wonderful United States, this democracy that would find against them for not having returned the security deposit to the renters within the 21 day period. And I tried to explain to them, I thought that was an extremely interesting perspective on their part. And again, cultural differences. And I had to explain to them that the judge would only apply the law. And they didn't believe me that no matter how bad the judge felt about their particular situation, the law was very clear when it stated that they had 21 days to return the deposit, which they had not done. So very glibly, they went off to court. We did not settle the case in mediation. And sure enough, the judge found for the tenants in the case. So that is an interesting example. And that was before I ever started actually practicing. That actually happened in my training, which I thought was very, very uh, important. Well, what did they think? should happen? Should, did, did they think they could just take whatever time they wanted? Yes, because when a tragedy like this occurred, um, and all of us know how horrible it is when you lose someone, particularly a child, particularly at such yeah. a young age with so much promise, they thought for sure the judge was going to forgive them and say, okay, we're going to give you uh, time to return it now. And, but that's not what happened. Uh, the judge applied the law only, and he ruled that they had to return the money forthwith, and they could not make, obviously, there's no payments to be made or anything like that. So they were completely shocked and blown away that our system had not functioned how they thought it would. Hmm. All right. Now, this happens all the time in divorce. I mean, people are quite surprised at the lack of emotional applicability <laughs> um, that judges will use. They have to follow the law. I, I, I mean, if they didn't follow the law, it would be hugely inconsistent. And why do you even have law then? You make a very good point. This was one of the things in the field of law there was a professor 
at, I believe it was Harvard University. His name was Roscoe Pound, and he's known as the father of mediation. And he was always hearing cases as a lawyer. And he felt that something was missing. But sometimes situations warranted something deeper than just the law. And again, because he is the father of mediation, he was the first, what we should we call mediator, where the benefit is being able to have local control and being able to think out of the box and have the parties maintain control and come up with a negotiated settlement. And I believe this was at the very beginning of the 20th century when this occurred. And this is the birth of mediation, basically. And it makes so much sense. Many times I've sat in a courtroom and the judge was only able to apply the law. And he many times or she would say, we have a mediator here today. Are you sure you don't want to go outside and do mediation with this? Particularly now when we're coming out of the moratorium for unlawful detainers and for evictions. We've had a moratorium for the last three years, the city of Los Angeles and other jurisdictions, because people could not pay their mortgages. And so they, we would have had a, a out and out mass evictions and people on the street. In order to avoid that, we had the moratorium. Now the rent is coming due. And people are, judges particularly, they're going to have to enforce the law now. So in mediation with an unlawful detainer, both parties have the power to work out a negotiated settlement about back payment of rent. And something that they're not going to get every single thing they ask for, neither party, but both parties are going to get something as opposed to an uneven playing field where there's no question that people owe rent in many cases and to be out on the street. Here is another example. Well, wait a minute. I, I want to get back to divorce because this is what the audience uh, is listening for. And that was a great example. But what I really wanted to know, and I kind of think it's similar how are mediators assigned litigants? So you have a hearing coming up. People have to go to court for some reason or another. They filed a case. They need the judge to be part of a decision-making situation. Uh, but so many times uh, the court wants uh, a mediator to see the couple first see the parties first and then see if they can work things out right so there's two parts to this how is a mediator assigned to a litigant and when they come to some compromise how is that communicated from the mediator to the judge okay that's a good question so basically every courtroom is different and it depends on what type of courtroom you're in in small claims court, for example, they want you to give a speech to all of the prospective litigants in the audience to promote mediation. When you're up in family law, which also included at one point for many, many years, civil harassment and the use of restraining orders. True. Um, again, the judges many times would sit at the bench when they came into the courtroom and they would talk about the benefits of mediation. So many times people don't know anything about what mediation is. So this is a very important question that you're asking because they're there to see the judge. So there has to be some type of an interaction, whether it comes from the judge, whether it comes from the mediator to let people know that the service is there and it's available. Okay, so I wanna clarify something since this is what you live through and I don't. What you just described, 
Does that mean that there are many litigants sitting in the courtroom waiting for their cases to be heard and the mediator comes on initially and says, I am Gail Glazer, I am the mediator, this is what mediation is. And then does the judge say, would any of you like to see Gail before your hearing? How does that work? Yes, that's exactly what happens. Okay. Or the bailiff, not necessarily the judge, but sometimes it would be the clerk of the court yeah. or it would be the bailiff. And they always emphasize that mediation is voluntary. And it is. It is indeed. But there's a bigger part to this whole scenario. And that is sometimes I'll go out, I'll introduce myself to all the litigants that are there for their cases that day. And I will ask to speak to them individually, take them into the mediation room and explain to them what mediation is all about. Now, I would say at least 75 to 80% of the normal person that comes into court and all types of people, all languages, all cultures, they don't know anything about what mediation is. They just know that they're there to try to settle their case They've missed work, they've spent time, money, aggravation, et cetera, and they are there to see the judge. We bring them into the room and we explain the process of mediation to them. And we explain what's going to happen to them and what the process is that the judge will do when they have their case ready to proceed. The thing that surprises me most in any courtroom, whether it's civil harassment, whether it's unlawful detainer, whether it's small claims, whether it's elder abuse, whether it's workplace violence, what's shocking is that people don't know that they have to prove their case. They have no clue that they have to bring any type of evidence. And once they find out because of the help that I'm giving them and the assistance to explain the process to them, they will say things like, oh, can I continue my case or can I go home and come back and get my evidence? So we come across problems like that as well. All right. So this would be a good stopping point before we before I ask the final question on this point about how you get hooked up with people uh, once you make the speech. But what do people think when they come to court? Now, there's a reason why they're there. They need somebody to make a decision about something and they don't know to bring information. No, very, very unsophisticated parties many times, not well-educated. And even the ones that are better well-educated, sometimes they're so sure that it's gonna be a slam dunk on their part that they don't realize that the burden of proof is on whoever the plaintiff or the petitioner is in the case. So that's a huge problem. And they simply do not know what is required of them. So what I offer to them, and I always tell them, I am not an attorney. I can give you absolutely no legal advice, but my experience all these years counts for something. And I can tell you based on my experience, what the judge is going to do, not how she's going to rule or he's going to rule, but what the process is. Yeah. And that seems really, really important. Once they agree, if they agree to mediate, sometimes people will say that they're going right back into the courtroom. They're only there to see the judge and they know they're going to win. And so, you know, I wish them well. I wish them luck. They go back in. But for those that stay, they go through a learning process that I think is huge and that you can say about those people, once they've had this experience and they ever get called into any courtroom again, no matter what kind it is, they're going to view this very differently. They're going to think about burden of proof. They're going to think about evidence. They're going to understand certain things from the assistance that we're giving them. I guess an old educator never dies. <laughs> and I see myself, since I started my career as an educator, it's a learning process. And when people get upset, I say to them, I hear that you're upset. I hear that this is very emotional for you, and I totally get it. But 
it's important that you use the part of your brain that's going to think pragmatically and rationally and put to rest the reptilian part of your brain that's only going for emotion. Because when you're under an emotional state like that, you cannot think clearly. So I believe the second part of your question was, when somebody does decide to mediate, how does that go down? Okay, so we do a mediation. We might do it. Well, no, 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 no. The, the second part was, how do you actually get the people time-wise assigned? How does this work out logistically? Okay, so like I said, either the judge will identify the parties to come in and mediate, or... I will give a speech and people will raise their hands and they'll say, I want to mediate. They'll sign up on the list. And I call one after the other, one party after the other. Or sometimes I go out into the hallway and I make a speech. I'll call a party's name, bring them into my room and ask them if they're interested in mediating. I'll explain to them what the process is, what they're up against explain things to them that they have no idea about. No, what, what logistically, Gail, what I meant was they have certain times that their case is being heard. I want to know how that's put together. So when they get their hearing assignment, at least in family law, you either have to show up at 8.30 in the morning or you show up at 1.30 in the afternoon. So there's a whole bunch of people right. assigned at that time sitting in the courtroom. Correct. So if people want to mediate, how do you interface with the bailiff or the clerk to say, I'm taking these cases to this room. And then when they're done, which I think is just an hour that you have for each person or each case, right? It depends. It depends on how busy the court is on that day, how many cases there are. Sometimes, because both parties have to be there in person to mediate, you'll have one party in the courtroom and one on Court Connect on the video monitor coming through. So that's off the table for mediation. So what I will do is I'll say, I'm going to start with case number so-and-so. I'll tell the bailiff, I'll tell the judicial assistant or the court clerk, and I will take them in and we will set a timer and we will spend perhaps a half hour, 45 minutes, if it's a good day, an hour, and we'll see what we can do with the case. And they will not know. One of the benefits of mediation also is if we mediate and get a settlement, the judge gives us priority 99% of the time so that people that are sitting in court all day, they don't know if they're going to be there from 8.30 to noon when the court breaks for lunch till 1.30, or if they have to come back at 1.30. Potentially, they could be sitting there all day waiting for their case to be called. So it's an incentive to them to mediate. And however the judge wants to call the cases is how the judge calls the cases. We don't have any control over that. All right. So then you take notes. Let's just say there's a partial settlement. You couldn't get to everything, but you got to some things. In this slam dunk time, which sounds very fast to me, how do you get your notes to the clerk for the judge for the hearing? Okay. So you sign what's called a settlement agreement. It's a form. And the form comes from the Center for Conflict Resolution. It's not exactly like the form that the courts use. We use our own forms mm -hmm. and we cover pretty much everything that we can. We write it down on the settlement agreement. Uh, we give copies to all of the parties. The judge gets a copy. E each party gets a copy and they then have to go in front of the court, in front of the judge and explain that they intend to fully cooperate with the settlement agreement. And the okay. judge will ask them such questions as, did anybody force you to sign this agreement? Did anybody promise you something for you to sign this agreement? Did you do this of your own free will? And the answers are yes, yes, and yes. And then the judge will say something to the effect of, your case is now dismissed without prejudice, if you have any further problems with this case, the court will retain jurisdiction. So if somebody doesn't follow through, if the settlement was that the defendant is going to play, pay the plaintiff a certain amount of money, 
in a certain amount of time or make payments, et cetera, they are going to have to follow through with that or the party is going to come back in and the court will retain jurisdiction. And so that's what the judge tells them. The deal points are memorialized in a minute order. That is correct. And that will be then mailed to the parties. It, that it, is only if it does not settle. If, with us, mediation, if it goes to the court, the judge will hear the case, take it under submission in certain court courtrooms. In others, they'll let you know right away. But um, take the case under submission, then you get a letter in U.S. mail. So again, you're not finding out that day many times who won, who didn't win, et cetera. What but, if it's me but if it's mediated, the, the judge honors that, correct? And right away. So you so, absolutely know what, what you're getting if you absolutely. settled in the mediation. And that's something that I always tell the parties that they're not aware of. They have no, they had no idea of that. So what happens is they walk out of the courtroom with a signed and stamped copy of from the court. And the court will file the case away. And it's only the minute order is only given when it goes in front of the judge. And again, it comes anywhere from five to seven days after the judge hears the case because he can only apply the law. That's what I tell people. There's going to be nothing but an application of the law. Okay. Let's go back to step one. So, we have people that can't afford me, and I don't cost a lot to file for hearings and trials and things, but they still can't afford me. So therefore they absolutely can't afford an attorney. How do they get into the court system and file? What help is provided there? Okay, I see that as a big problem because there is help, there are in every, there is in every courthouse what's called a self-help center, and they're staffed with um, people that will answer questions and help them. However, I'm assuming that there's different interpreters there, or they can get an interpreter, or their predominant language in all courthouses in Los Angeles County is Spanish. So they can get help that way. But the truth of the matter is that there are a lot of people that don't know what they're doing and they don't know how to reach out to these self-help centers. And they're very lost deer in the headlights when they come into court, particularly up in family law. In family law, they have to see a mediator that works for the LA County system. And that in a divorce mediation, for example, the judge will send them to mediation, which is upstairs. That's not the same type of mediation that we do. Um, the mediator listens to the case and makes recommendations to the judge regarding custody, regarding holidays, visitation, money, all of those types of things. And the judge then makes a decision with all of these different pieces of the puzzle. In mediation, that is not family law. Everything is done by the parties. So I think that not only does a mediator who is remaining neutral and impartial the entire time, but is also on a journey to help people, to take them from point A to point B, while all the time, teaching them what's going to happen, what's going to occur in the courtroom, and giving them the tools to make an informed decision on their own. Okay, let's go back to the self-help center, though. So there's a self-help center in every courthouse. And if you want to file for a legal separation or a divorce, uh, or if you're unmarried and you need to open a custody case, you go to the self-help center, you say, this is what I'm here to accomplish. 
And then it's my understanding that they'll give a packet of forms applicable to what you need to file for is given to them. And I'm, I'm li I listen to some of my own clients who tried it that way and became too baffled. I think they get more forms than they really need. They just get this giant package of forms and they have to sort out what to use, what not to use. There's no question. And this is a huge problem that I, I'm seeing that people are encountering. Um, I don't know how often and what hours these self-help centers are open. I remember um, the one that when I used to work in Pasadena Superior Court, that was a huge one with a huge room with many, many people that were there helping and calling people. And they do come up with all of this paperwork. So they're sitting down on a one-to-one -one with whomever is helping them navigate through this paperwork because the paperwork has to be filed with the court in order to start the process and the ball rolling. For example, if they're talking about custody or child support or and they're not married, and even if they are married, whatever, it's a very difficult process for people made even more so when they're new to the country. Right. Right. Because they're not understanding the language well enough. They're not understanding the way the court system. Well, well, you know what? You could be born here and you won't understand how the court system works. I mean, that was an education for all of us, right? Especially Absolutely. me who files. Absolutely. Very tough. So what I'd love to know is, or what I'd love to say is what I have found out. Some self-help centers are more helpful than others. Some will say, well, I, I, you know, answering any of your questions means I'm giving you legal advice and I want to punch them because that's not what it means. Talking about how this courthouse uses forms is not legal advice. It's called, how does this courthouse use farms, forms? And I almost feel like it's a cop out and it really bothers me because some people absolutely don't have the financial means to use any of us. Maybe they don't eat, maybe they're not even comfortable going on Google. I call it Google Law School because I look at Google if I have a question before I call anybody. Well, maybe Google can tell me what to do. I use it all the time. But it really bothers me that the self, some self-help centers are great though. They actually, you can call ahead and they have a limited number of seating, but you can literally schedule to be in a class. And I guess the classes are composed of different areas of law so that whoever's going to conduct the class is conducting it for one area of law and then can start pulling forms. The other thing that I have found, and I'd like to know if you did as well, and that is you just don't file everything at once. There is a schedule and a timing of when you file these forms. And sometimes you have to wait X number of days to file another form, at least in family law, that's the way it goes. Is it like that in other areas of law? Is there a timing issue? If it's uh, I point? believe there is, but I don't get into what I do. I don't have anything to do with the filing of papers. Yeah. That all is in the domain of the judicial assistant or court clerk. Okay. And so all I know that when you look at the paperwork and peruse it, there are huge packets for every type of a court case that you may have. And it is a very disconcerting process because people don't know what they're doing. It's trial and error. Now, you bring up a very good question, Judy. And that is, there's just not enough legal representation because it's too expensive. I believe I read somewhere where the typical attorney in California is charging $340 an hour, which is beyond the means of somebody making minimum wage. And the problem then is that the state bar realized that this was a problem and they put forth a bill in the assembly 
And the bill was to try to have a paraprofessional grouping to diminish this particular problem. The paraprofessional would be like, if there are not enough doctors to go around in rural areas um, of the state or remote areas of the state, they decided to start a licensing back in the 1970s for things like uh, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. And that's what's being promoted now by the bar. But uh, the attorneys in the state are very much set against that. They were able to shut the bill down and the bill now is not coming up for another round until I believe 2025. I see both sides of the story. As mediators, we see both sides of the story. I can certainly understand why the attorneys and the different bar associations feel the way they do. Believe me, I get it. But by the same token, what would be another way to address the problem of not having enough representation for the masses, the huge masses of people in the state that don't have access to attorneys? I have an answer for that because I got very much um uh, I got educated about the paraprofessionals last year because it was going to affect family law. And so the paraprofessional would be somebody like me, a paralegal, who then would take a task, get additionally licensed to be a paraprofessional. And that person could do two things that right now I'm not allowed to do. And that would be give legal advice ahead of a court case and show up at the courthouse, sit in the courtroom at the table next to the litigant, not really argue the case for them, but kind of whisper in their ear and let them know what was going on. I definitely understand, like you do, why attorneys would be upset, because I am staunch in saying Everybody needs legal advice. Everybody needs to talk to an attorney, but if you can't afford it, so just like there are fee waivers, because there are filing fees that go that are attached to every case. We didn't say that, but now's a good time. There are filing fees attached to each case, but if you fall in the poverty level and it's and, and there's a grid that shows you what the poverty level is, okay. X number of people in the household, less than X number do of dollars a month, you can file for a fee waiver. So maybe, and maybe we're solving a problem here, Gail, that would be phenomenal. Maybe it's like a fee waiver. You have to financially qualify for a paraprofessional because the attorneys aren't going to get these people anyway. You make a great point, and that could be from your mouth to God's ears and to the mouth and to the ears of the state legislature. I think that there have been many um, solutions proposed, but that I haven't heard proposed in the way that you just did it. And I think that that makes perfect sense because some of the other solutions was to, um, I'm trying to think some of the, of the other ones were something to the effect of um, lower the standards for the bar so more people could qualify to be attorneys. Okay, that would not be a good idea. I agree. Yeah. 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 None of them would have been, uh, I can't remember what the other proposals were, but one of the things I, that I heard attending a, a bar association meeting on this was that they do not want stores to open up inside Kmart. I'm sorry, not Kmart anymore. Target, I know, I know what you mean. The Costco Walmart, yeah, profession. The Costco, and you you walk in there and you pay your money and you have access to a paralegal, and um. They're very, they, they don't want that to happen. Uh, well, I wouldn't want that to happen either. No, that actually no. really diminishes the role of the paraprofessional. I totally agree. And then, but now the other side of the coin is how many paraprofessionals want to work for free? Everybody has to pay bills. See, that's the problem. You know, we live in, in, in an expensive country and it's very difficult. I got a call last week by a lovely man 
when I gave him my fees, he said, that's very steep. Well, you know, that told me that he's not making money because I'm not very steep at all for my filing service. And I said, you know, you really should go to the self-help center and see see what you can get done there. But let's let's finish with interpreters because we started with language. Let's end with language. Somebody doesn't speak English. It doesn't matter what language they speak. Somebody doesn't speak English, but they have a legal need. They need to use the court. I guess they have to bring somebody with them initially just to get to figure out what to do, where to, okay, tell me what they do. Okay, so when you file the paperwork, there's a part on the form that says, I need an interpreter. Oh, but but you have to be able to read the form. Well, some of the forms are in Spanish. And well, what about other also, languages? What yeah. about other languages? Okay, right. You're in a problem. So then somebody like that is going to use a child that speaks English well, or a friend, or somebody that they know in their family to help them. So I believe that the forms are available in, I believe, Korean, um, Vietnamese, Chinese, Mandarin, the... Chi Mandarin yeah. Chinese, Spanish, and I'm not sure, but I have worked with a lot of, of interpreters. I think there's like something like 83 languages in wow. our county. And Farsi, Armenian, there's so many languages, so many. Okay. And on the form when you're filing initially, there is a section where you let them know that you're going to need an attorney. And then- An, inter when, an interpreter. An oh, interpreter. pardon me, pardon me. Yes. yes, an interpreter. And the court clerk then has the responsibility to get somebody into the courtroom. Even with the multitude of Spanish speakers, the interpreters, uh, sometimes, you, you know, you'll have to recall the case because there's no interpreter available at that moment. They're upstairs in another courtroom and they're just spread very thin. So other times you have to wait and wait and wait because the um, Polish interpreter is somewhere else at another courthouse in the city or they can't get on the on the court connect or whatever the case may be. So it's further confusing when English is not your first language along with everything else. So again, that's an important and a very good point that you make, Judy. Okay, so in the navigation piece of this conversation, uh, somebody who does not speak English, let's just say they speak Korean, uh, they must bring somebody who's bilingual, bilingual Korean English with them initially to the courthouse, go to the self-help center, and ask for forms if they're in Korean. If they're not, then the person they brought with them is going to have to help them fill the forms out. Okay, so the forms are then filled out and submitted to the court. They get a hearing date. Before the hearing date, they have to schedule an interpreter. How does that work? No, on the initial application for the hearing date, it's marked on there that they're going to need, whenever the hearing date is going to occur, they're going to need to have an interpreter from that particular language present in court that day. They are not allowed to bring anybody in like a child, a relative. They must use an official interpreter. I see. Okay. And so they don't pay for the interpreter. The that is correct. County ah, okay. So I learned something new today. I had no idea that's how it worked. Yes. Okay. Interesting. All right. What haven't I asked you? Hold on. Um. What? What did have? You, do you want to say anything that you thought was important that I have not asked? I think that mediation is one of the best forms to resolve conflict around because it's a neutral process, number one. Number two, the parties have the control, not somebody telling them like in, in a judge or an arbitrator or a private judge or anybody like that, telling them how it's going to be. They can actually have the power to negotiate and think of something outside of the box. Instead of paying somebody for their services, 
maybe they can do some type of an exchange. There's all types of creative solutions that we can work out in mediation. I just wish that more people understood what mediation is so that we didn't have to explain it again and again and again. Um, and that seems to be, you know, what we're doing. Well, when you say, um, when, when you're speaking about mediation, are you speaking about private mediation where people charge? I'm talking about any type of mediation. Okay. okay. And uh, I don't know if in your practice you have mediator. Uh, you are the mediator. I'm just I saying. Am, yeah. yeah. No, what I'm saying is, is in uh, when people have attorneys, uh, many times they come in there, I'm sure, for the mediation. But just as far as people knowing what it is, if people, one of the things that they are already know about mediation, if they've ever been through a divorce, and when I ask them that question, when they come into the mediation room, they'll say, yes, I had a mediated divorce. So I do know what mediation is. Okay, excellent. But you you said something that I hadn't asked about, which I think is important, and that is, if you are represented by an attorney, because this is all about navigating the court system. So people do have money and people can bring attorneys. Do the attorneys go into the mediation scale? Yes, absolutely. And it had very interesting experiences with that, particularly up in civil harassment where people are trying to get restraining orders. Um, so what happens is a lot of attorneys up there, they could be there for the petitioner, they could be there for the respondent. Uh, and it's very interesting wonderful, wonderful attorneys. I've met many wonderful attorneys, but an attorney is there to litigate. That's what their background is for the most part, many of them. Some of them are also mediators. The ones that are mediators understand the process. The ones that are criminal particularly and litigators, many times they'll come in and walk into the mediation and they'll say to me, okay, you're the mediator. So before we come to any agreement, I want to put this on the table. And that is, I want the other side, the client on the other side to pay my attorney fees. And I look at that person and I say, and I'm supposed to be neutral and impartial if I would put something like that on the table. I said, if that's the way you feel, then please, by all means, take your case and go in and hear the judge. The judge can give you perhaps your attorney fees. But that's a very good example of the difference between litigation and mediation. And all I know is family law. And in family law, if one party wants the other party to pay attorney's fees, you have to file for it. And so yes. either you mediate that right. or the judge makes a decision on that. Right. So I find that that's very interesting when an attorney, knowing that he would have to fill out additional paperwork later on and put it in front of the judge to uh, agree to his fees. When they come into mediation, that's the first thing many, not everybody, okay, but many. And right away, you think to yourself as a mediator, how is this mediation? It's not. And so anybody that would say, okay, that, that sounds fair and put that on the table. I mean, I just, it just goes against everything that a mediator does. Gail, do you, have you ever had just attorneys come in the mediation and their clients sat outside in the hallway? I've spoken to attorneys. I don't like to do that because it means that I'm going to have to backtrack and go over it again with their clients. Um, so what I really like to do is to make sure that the party's in there because they have to understand for themselves what's going on and what's being proposed. So no, I don't like to do that because it makes more work. You've got to have the client in there with the attorney. And from me as a mediator, I have literally been blessed by some of the nicest attorneys in family law that have shown up in mediations, but generally they don't. Generally, it's the parties themselves, even if they have legal counsel or they're represented. But there are those cases that I've inherited where it's in the middle of the case and they will tell me, well, my attorney just told me to sit in the hall and they would go in and, and make decisions and I don't like what happened. And I'm like, oh my gosh, these poor people didn't know 
because they've never done this before, that they should say, no, 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 I don't want you to go in in place of me. I want to be there. This is my life. I want to be part of the decision making. I don't want you to commit me to anything that I might not want to do. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. And you bring up a very, very important point. You've got to empower. I understand that attorney's there to advocate for you, but you in mediation have to understand yourself and make your own decisions and then run it by your attorney, whatever you decide. And whatever happens, happens. But at least I want them in the room. It's the most important thing. Good. I think that's an extremely important point to end with. Gail, this has been great. Our time is coming to a close. I've really enjoyed this discussion. I have. I found out some things I didn't know. That's always a good thing. Well, Judy, I want to thank you for having me on your program today. It's been a pleasure and um, I, I very much appreciate it. So thank you. Well, and thank you for calling me and suggesting the topic. This came from Gail, everybody. And I said, absolutely. Never talked about this. Let's do it. Let's shed some light on uh, pull the curtain back to what goes on in the courthouse. So thank you so much for your time and your knowledge. My pleasure. Thank you. And thank all of you for listening. If you have any topics you would like to suggest, you know, you can do that through my website, theamicabledivorceexpert.com. If you have anything to say about this topic, any experiences you would like to share, please do. I think this is a great topic. And as always, have an amicable day.